Hello there, good evening and welcome. This is The Lost and Forgotten on TV1. Our topic of discussion tonight is the Austrians who settled here in Sri Lanka. And joining me in the studios, as always, is Dr. Zamir Karim from the University of Colombo. Good evening to Zamir and welcome to the show, as always. Very good evening, Hassan. Let's start off by talking about the arrivals, just as we spoke about uh, the arrivals of several other communities. Uh, tell us a little bit about the arrivals of the Austrian community in Sri Lanka. Okay, so talking about the Austrians, you can trace their arrival to our nation as early as the 16th century. So during the Portuguese colonial period, that's when most of the Austrians arrived. And likewise, even during the Dutch colonial period, there were many Austrian soldiers, there were mercenaries who came to our country, including traders who came from Austria as well as from other parts of Europe who are of Austrian descent. Likewise, during the British colonial period, that's when there were many Austrians who settled in different parts of the island. There were missionaries, there were traders, there were Austrian planters who came to the country. There were also Jewish immigrants who came to Ceylon and sought refuge in our country who hailed from Austria. Likewise, there were Austrian educationists, theosophists, even a Buddhist monk who came to our nation. Likewise, there was a significant population of Austrians who came and settled in Ceylon during the British colonial period. Likewise, there were traders, there were merchants, there were companies established by the Austrians in Ceylon. Likewise, we maintained strong ties with Austria during the British colonial period and even prior to that. But what really attracted the Austrians towards Sri Lanka? What was the catching point? Okay, so what happened is during the Portuguese colonial period, so that's when we started establishing strong ties with Austria. So Austria, in the sense, we established ties with the Habsburgs. So what happens is, like, if you want to understand why did we establish, we know that in the 16th century that our island, the maritime provinces of our country, were colonized by the Portuguese. So the Portuguese maintained strong ties with the Habsburgs. Now, Habsburgs is actually a royal dynasty of German origin, so they get the name Habsburg from a castle in Switzerland, but the Habsburg in fact had significant influence over various countries in the European continent. So the Habsburgs ruled Austria starting from the late 13th century all the way up until the early 20th century, the Habsburgs ruled. Okay, So they were part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and prior to that the Holy Roman Empire. So all the Habsburg monarchs had significant control in Central and Western Europe. And through political alliances and matrimonial alliances, they also had strong ties with Portugal. So when we take 16th century, early 16th century, when Ceylon was, uh, you know, when the Portuguese had just established themselves in our country, they established trading posts and colonial enclaves in different parts of Asia and Africa. So in Ceylon, when Bune Kubaho VII was the king of Kote, he maintained ties with King John III of Portugal. And King John III of Portugal's wife, Catherine, was a princess of Austria. So during the Portuguese colonial period, because the Habsburg had significant influence in Portugal, in Spain, as well as in many countries, yes, there is evidence to prove that there were mercenaries, there were soldiers who hailed from the Habsburg royal dynasties, from the kingdoms which were ruled by the Habsburgs. So during the Portuguese period, yes, there were people who hailed from Austria because there was a time that even Portugal and Spain were ruled by the Habsburgs. Mm -hmm. There were Habsburg monarchs who ruled the present day kingdoms of like Spain as well as when you talk about Portugal and many other nations in Central and Western Europe were ruled by the Habsburgs. So because of this particular reason, there were Habsburg monarchs as well as there were Habsburg uh, mercenaries and soldiers who maintained strong ties with the Portuguese. And there, there are evidences to prove that there might have been mercenaries and soldiers who hailed from Austria who could have arrived to Sri Lanka during the Portuguese colonial period. And talking about the ties, we even had trade links with uh, various Habsburg monarchs, the kingdoms. This is even prior to the advent of the Portuguese. Even when we talk about Charlemagne, this is during the Carolingian Empire, which also encompassed many countries, including Austria. Even during that period, we did send many of our treasures, like ivory, for example, is even still popular in Europe. You go to all these Austrian museums in various palaces in Austria and beyond, that especially in the European continent, you'll find ivory caskets, ivory artifacts, jewelry, precious stones like sapphire, blue sapphire. I was so prized. From Ceylon, these items were exported to these countries. This is even prior to the advent and settlement of the Portuguese. Mm -hmm. So we did maintain strong trade ties with Austria as well as with various other countries. Even when you talk about their crown jewels, sapphires in particular, because sapphires represents heaven. Mm -hmm. Blue sapphire from Ceylon represents heaven and it also represents the Christian promise of salvation. 
So because it represents the Christian promise of salvation, uh, like Charlemagne, likewise various other monarchs and Holy Roman emperors and Austrian monarchs, they all owned jewels that came all the way from Ceylon. Likewise, because we were ruled by the Portuguese as well, and the Portuguese, the Portugal was ruled by the Habsburg, Philip the First, Second, the Third, all hailed from the Habsburg dynasty. So they are wives, they are members of the royal household. As a result of this inbreeding which took place within the you know, European royal houses because Habsburg's rule had extensive control over various territories as a result of matrimonial alliances. So these marriages strengthened their power in Europe. You have countries like even Netherlands during the Dutch colonial period as well had, a, had Habsburg monarchs ruling them. So when our country was ruled by the Portuguese and the Dutch and various others, during the same period in Europe, the Habsburg were exercising considerable power in all these countries, whether it be in Portugal, whether it be in Spain, as well as in Netherlands. Because of this particular reason, there were many soldiers who came from what is present-day Austria to Ceylon during the Portuguese colonial era. Was it only soldiers who came during the period of the Portuguese? Or I BBC? surmise based on the records that there might have been traders who would have also arrived because of the fact that we did export various mm -hmm. commodities and you know ivory and jewels and all those things. Likewise, even elephants were transported from our country all the way to Austria. There is a story in 1542 that King Bunekabahu, who also sent his grandson's gold statue of Prince Dharampala, was sent to Portugal. Right, to be there was this investiture ceremony, a symbolic investiture ceremony of a gold statue of a local prince of Kote, that is Dharmapala's gold statue with the crown and various jewels and ivory caskets were sent to, uh, to Lisbon, to Portugal, to be crowned by King John III of Portugal. Right? And this entourage that went to Portugal also took with them an elephant, which was named Suleiman, as a jibe at the Ottoman Emperor Suleiman the Magnificent. And this elephant was later presented to Maximilian II of Austria, who was the Holy Roman Emperor. So we did maintain strong trade, trade ties, and this was during the Portuguese colonial period. And then during the Dutch colonial period as well, we maintain strong ties with the Austrians. How was life like for the Austrians uh, in Sri Lanka during the period of the Dutch? Okay, so talking about the Dutch colonial era, again when the Dutch East India Company was established, they recruited soldiers and mercenaries who hailed from different parts of Europe. So likewise, when the Austrians and the French and the Flemish and the Swedish and various other countrymen, when they joined the VOC, they took an oath of allegiance to serve under the command of the Dutch officers in the Dutch East India Company. So due to this particular reason, there were many Austrians who came to our country and even to Today we do have Dutch burger families of Austrian origin still living in our nation. Likewise, there was a significant population of Austrian traders who came to our country as well during the Dutch colonial era. And there were many who settled in different parts of our island. And during this period as well, there are records of certain Jews who in fact survived religious persecution in those countries and came to our nation. But their significant settlement was definitely during the uh, British colonial period. But even going back, there was a king of our country. I'm sure you must have heard of King Vimaladam. Surya the first. King Vimala Dharma Surya was the first, who was the king of our nation. This was in the 16th century as well as in the early 17th century. He was called Don John of Austria. That was the title bestowed upon him because he was originally a Catholic king. He converted to Catholicism. He was trained by the Portuguese in Goa, the ecclesiastical capital of Portuguese India. So he was trained by the Portuguese. Prior to his baptism, he was called Konnapu Bandara. Okay, so that is his original name, Konnapu Bandara, and later he converted to Catholicism and he was the, given the name Don John of Austria by the Portuguese. The reason why Don John of Austria, because there was a famous Austrian uh, warrior, right, a prince who was called Don John of Austria, who was the illegitimate son of King Charles V of Austria, likewise the stepbrother of King Philip II of Spain and Portugal. So because of this particular reason, because the man was already dead, so in his memory, that is in memory of this uh, prince of Austria, Don John of Austria, Vimala Dharma Surya I was called Don John of Austria. So when you read colonial records, for example, if you read the itineraries of the first Dutch envoys who came to our country, like Joris van Spielbergen, or you read the accounts of Sabal de Wert, or various other colonial writers, including Robert Knox, who was held captive in our nation during the 17th century. So all these colonial records refer to King Vimala Dharma Surya I as Don John of Austria. So we had a Sri Lankan king who was identified by a title of an Austrian prince. 
So who hailed from that part of the world? So we, Vimrat Amasuri was called Don John of Austria, and even during this period, as I mentioned earlier, like in the Portuguese, had strong ties with the Habsburgs. So because of that reason, we did have significant inflow of Austrian soldiers and mercenaries. And during the Dutch colonial period, various traders came to our country and settled on the maritime provinces of our nation. Right. I mean, I want to ask you about uh, how the Austrians formed themselves as a community in the country. But before that, you said that. Uh, the arrivals of the Austrians were significant during the period of the British. That was when the British invaded the country. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about uh, the arrivals of the Austrians during the period of the British, uh, their activities in the country, and how was life like for them? Okay, so what happened during the British colonial period, the British colonial era is considered to be the golden age for the Jews. Right? So the reason why you say it's the golden age for the Jews is because even a man named Benjamin Disraeli, who is a man of Jewish ancestry, did become the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. So this was during the Victorian era. So because of this particular reason, the British in fact favoured the settlement of Jews from different parts of Europe in our country during the British colonial period. That is starting from the 19th century all the way up until the 20th century, there were Jews who came from different parts of Europe, right? So then Austria was part of the Holy Roman Empire and then later the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So from Austria, there were many Jews who came to establish their businesses. So there were many Austrian planters who came to Ceylon and they purchased lands in the highlands and then they cultivated tea and rubber and various other commodities in our country. Likewise, they were involved in spice trade. And talking about their contribution, the tea sampling was first planted by an Austrian. The de Worms family that established tea plantations in our country were in fact, their nationality is given as Austrian. They are in fact Jewish, a very powerful Jewish clan. Their maternal grandfather was in fact Maya Amschel Rothschild, the founding father of the Rothschild dynasty. They came to Ceylon in the 1840s. Three brothers came to our country, Maurice Benedict de Worms, Solomon Benedict de Worms and Gabriel Benedict de Worms. So they were born in Frankfurt in Germany, but they did have significant ties with Austria because they had many relations in Austria. So from Austria, from Germany, from these parts of Europe, from Central and Western Europe, there were many Jews who came to our country who did hold Austrian citizenship, mm -hmm. right? So they were Austrian nationals, they were subjects of the Austrian king. So they came to Ceylon and Maurice Benedict de Worms, who purchased vast estates in our country, in Purcellava, in the Highlands, there were around 8,000 acres of land owned by these de Worms brothers. They had enterprises not just in the Highlands, but also in Colombo. They imported the first tea seedlings from China. Like though we give the credit to James Taylor as well as Sir Thomas Lipton. Sir Thomas Lipton and James Taylor were Scotsmen and Thomas Lipton was an also Scot of Irish descent. So they came to our country in the 1860s and developed the tea trade, right? Hmm. But when we talk about the history of tea, the introduction, tea, of, the tea introduction of tea is that what Maurice Benedict de Worms, what did he do is he actually got tea samplings all the way from China and got them planted in his small nursery in Pusillava. Right, so he owned 8,000 acres of land and 2,000 acres was reserved for the cultivation of tea so, and so copper. So just to get it clear, tea yeah. cultivations did not exist uh, before that in Sri Lanka? No, tea uh, cultivation did not exist in the sense it was not like a full-time trade. Mm. So the trade was started only in the 1860s, but the first man who got tea samplings all the way from China and got them planted in Ceylon was these de Worms brothers. So they had their estate in Pusella, but there is an estate known as Rothschild Estate. It's still called Rothschild Estate. It's not owned by the Austrians or by the Rothschilds, but it is still called Rothschild Estate. But this tea sampling being brought to the country, being it was an experiment. It was not for a commercial venture because it was high production costs were there back then. And then they also had labor issues because they had to bring down intentioned laborers. Back then we had not started a proper tea cultivation in our country and coffee was very popular. So because coffee was very popular, not many were interested in cultivating tea. So during this period, I'm talking about 1840s, we had Maurice, Gabriel and Solomon de Worms, right, who came to our island and established tea plantations. They also owned coffee plantations and various other enterprises in our country. They became affluent as a result of Ceylon. In fact, they managed to purchase properties even in England, right? So during the Victorian era, as a result of the trade, as a result of various enterprises, they established in Ceylon, right? So this, in fact, 
helped various other Austrians to also come establish their businesses over here. There was a company called Lloyd Company, which was involved in steam navigation. So all these various companies, Lloyd Company was in Prince Street in York, number three Prince Street. So various companies were established in the Fort region, in Colombo, as well as in the Highlands. And then what happened in 1860s, the deworms left our nation and went to Europe. The reason being that there was coffee blight in our country. So the coffee plantations were devastated. And then because of the high production cost and labor issues, they couldn't really promote the tea trade. And in fact, Solomon Benedict de Worms was even made baron by the Emperor of Austria. He was made baron. He was given a title by the Emperor of Austria. And this title was even recognized by Queen Victoria. The title was given to him by the Austrian Emperor in 1871. But in 1872, Baron Solomon de Worms was identified as Baron Solomon even in England because Queen Victoria gave special dispension for him to use the Austrian title in England. And he managed to purchase various properties as a result of the fortune they collected in Ceylon, right? Mm -hmm. So the Ceylonese tea trade as well as various other plantations plus the industries which they established helped the deworms to flourish. So during this British colonial period, there were many such families that came to the country. We even had an Austrian consul and his family living in our nation, like a permanent representative body of Austro-Hungarian Empire in our nation. The reason being that because we had strong ties with the Austrians, hence there were Austrian planters who came to our nation, purchased tea estates, coffee plantations and all that. And besides our country being popular for the trade and coffee and tea, there were even Austrian members of royalty who came to our nation. And the reason why they came to our country is because of the trophy hunting, big game hunting as it was called. So hunting elephants was a popular sport at the time. And then they used to make these hunting expeditions to our part of the world, all the way from Austria. I'm not sure whether you have heard of Franz Ferdinand of Austria, Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria. It is his death that incited the, Second world, the First World War. The First World War in 1914 started as a result of the death of Franz Ferdinand II of Austria. He came to our nation in 1893. He was in Ceylon from the 5th of January all the way up until the 14th of January 1893. Franz Ferdinand of Austria, the Archduke of Austria, was in our country. He was living in our nation. He came for a short sojourn because he was busy hunting elephants. Mm -hmm. It is said that he has killed over 300,000 animals during his various hunting expeditions. And in Ceylon, he hunted various elephants in our country. How many elephants were hunted? There is no record on how many elephants he hunted right. during his short sojourn. But one of the, because back then, when you kill the elephant, the parts of the elephant's body were considered as trophies, as relics. And these relics and trophies were taken to Austria to be exhibited in Austrian palaces and stuff. So what he did was one of the elephants that he shot in this country, in Kalamana, he used the leg of this elephant as a waste paper basket. He used it as a waste paper basket and another part of another carcass was used as an ashtray. Right? So there were many Austrian princes, members of royalty, aristocracy, squires from all parts of Europe surged into Sri Lanka, this was during the British colonial period, just for the purpose of hunting elephants. There is a chair which is made of this elephant whom I mentioned, the Suleiman, right, the elephant that was gifted by King Bonek about the 7th to King John III of Portugal, which eventually ended up in Austria and was then owned by King Maximilian II of Austria. He owned it in his menagerie. The bones of this elephant were later fashioned into a chair and it is still to be seen in the Crestmonster Abbey, which is a Benedictine monastery in Austria. Likewise, the hide, the skin of the elephants, which were hunted in Ceylon, were also sent to various parts of the uh, globe. They were stuffed, they were exhibited in even the Bavarian Museum. And even the Prince of Liechtenstein, Liechtenstein is now a principality, an independent mm -hmm. country, but back then they were also ruled by the Austrians. There was a whole strong Austrian influence. Even the Prince of Liechtenstein visited our country, and this was in 1894. And there was an am amusing uh, incident which took place because he had some sort of a wrangle with uh, a clerk in the Gaul Kacheri, and this was in 1894. And there was a person named Arthur Fitz, Dr. Arthur Fitz, who came to Ceylon and he became a Buddhist monk and he's believed to be an illegitimate son of an Austrian prince, grandson of Emperor Franz Joseph of Austria. Mm -hmm. He came to our nation. He's said to have lived in the uh, Dedundua Island Hermitage, which is in Polgasdua, right? So it's an island hermitage where many 
monks who came from Germany as well as other parts of Europe lived in this little island hermitage. Mm. So this Arthafids, who claimed to be of royal lineage, who is supposed to have been a, a descendant, a grandson of the emperor of Austria, came to Ceylon, he was ordained into monkhood, he accepted Buddhism and he lived in Ceylon during this period. And what happened was when the First World War broke out, as I mentioned, First World War broke out because Franz Ferdinand of Archduke of Austria and his wife Sophie were killed in Sarajevo by, in Bosnia by a Bosnia-Serbian nationalist. So when, upon his death, this incited the whole First World War and series of wars that broke out. So during this period, I'm talking about the First World War, all the Austrians living in our country were apprehended by the British. So they were all apprehended by the British and taken by the British to the Diyatalawa camp for internment. So they were held captive in Diyatalawa camp, whether it be Buddhist monks, whether it be planters, there is a list. If you read the book, Enemies in the Empire, it is a lovely book written by Stefan and Mans and various others. So this book talks about the Austrians who were living in Ceylon during the British colonial period and those who were apprehended during the First World War and then also during the Second World War and they were taken for internment in the Atalawa camp and they were held captive over there including monks, planters, business, Mughals. There were hotels run by the Austrians in the country as well in the fort region. There were various restaurants run by them. As I mentioned, there were many planters who were Austrian nationals who were living in the country and there were even those who were involved in politics. Zami, I mean, you talked us through uh, the arrivals of the Austrians during the period of the Portuguese, the Dutch and uh, later on during the period of the British as well. At any point of time, did the Austrians come together as one community and practice their own customs, rituals? Did we see anything of that sort happening? Okay, so during the British colonial period, majority of the Austrians who came to the country were in fact Catholics. Likewise, we had the Jews. So talking about the Catholics, there were even Catholic missionaries who came from Austria and they were part of various schools and colleges across the island, missionaries, like as missionary hospitals were run by them. And then again, starting from the 20th century, there came many who were interested in in communism right so you had European radicals who came from Austria and settled in our country and this was during the British colonial era we had people who were Austrians who worked at the University of Colombo University of Ceylon so talking about some of the most prominent Austrians who settled in our country was Hedy Kahneman Peter Kahneman who was the Minister of National Housing and Government his wife Hedy who was born Heidi Simon right so she was born Heidi Simon and she was an Austrian Jew who came to our country and this was she in fact studied in the University of Cambridge and she had many suitors because of the fact that she was beautiful. And then she fell in love with this dashingly handsome burger man, Peter Kahneman, came to our country. She was denied uh, the degree from the Cambridge University because she was a woman, right? And she was interested in communism. She came to our nation, right? And this was during the Second World War. Our country was devastated as a result of short supply of grains and provisions. And what happened is she joined the Ceylon Civil Defense Department. An Austrian Jew came to our nation who was interested in communism. Her husband was also deeply involved. She became a supervisor attached to the Ceylon Civil Defense Department and she had to manage the rations that were supplied to our country, rice and various other commodities that were exported all the way from Burma. They had to, she was responsible to distribute. So what she used to do is she was barefoot. She used to wear a red cotton sari go around the country by bus and train and what she used to do is supply grain provisions and also make sure that there were retail shops likewise to make sure that every person in this country did supply rice and when there was a shortage of rice she wanted to promote a substitute and that was cereals so the cereals which she substituted was bajiri so she was referred to as bajiri nona and she was also attached to the university of ceylon because she was also a graduate of philosophy so she taught philosophy at the university of ceylon and taught Talking about academics who are of Austrian descent, talking, let's take Valley Risch, Dr. Valley Risch, or who's also identified as Valley Reich, depending on how you would want to pronounce the name. He was the very first professor of modern European languages at the University of Ceylon, was an Austrian Jew who came to our country, and it was Dr. Valley Reich. Likewise, there were many other Austrian painters who came to our country during this period. For example, Franz Kienmeier, who came to our nation. Likewise, various other, like Joseph Salami, who was a very prominent painter, Austrian painters, impressionists, various artists came to our country during the British colonial period because they were fascinated by the beauty of our nation, the natural sceneries of our country, 
they came to our nation and they established various you know places various institutions likewise they were involved in promoting education in our country they had a significant influence even in politics so they have left a strong and indelible imprint on the history of our nation definitely i think the lists can go on and on True. if we have too numerous to enumerate too, too numerous if we have enough time we can yes. definitely go into that very quickly before we wrap uh, this segment of the show do we have austrians living in the country at present we do have people of austrian descent living in the country like i mentioned the burgers are of austrian descent so because of this particular reason we have burger families of austrian descent living in our nation likewise there were a few who lived until the single only act and after the passing of the single only act many went especially the jews went to israel and settled in israel while others found refuge in various other countries and the burgers left our country and went to australia thank you very much zamir for appearing on the show tonight and talking us through the arrivals of the austrians and their contributions to this country we'll be back with another interesting uh, topic to discuss on our show uh, that's next friday at 9:30 pm on tv1 do stay with us and take care